In this video, we're going to focus on improper integrals that have infinite discontinuities or asymptotes at either of the endpoints of the interval or in the center. So again, there are two ways to have an improper integral. In our last video, we focused on what happens when one or both of the limits of integration are infinite, because we know in order to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, we need a continuous function and finite limits of integration. So our first examples had to do with infinite limits of integration. In this video, we are going to focus on infinite discontinuities. So either a discontinuity or asymptote at the lower limit of integration, the upper limit of integration, or somewhere in between. For our first example, let's take a look at what happens when our function has an infinite discontinuity at b, or at the upper limit of integration. Looking at this uh, graph that I've provided for you, we can see that there would be an asymptote at x equals 8. And 8 happens to be one of our limits of integration, so that's why this is an improper integral. So essentially what we're saying is it's okay to continue to integrate this, but what we want to do is we want to find the limit, and you can use C or B or A or whatever you want, don't use X. Um, the limit as B approaches eight, that upper limit of integration from the left-hand side. So essentially what we're saying is as B approaches eight from this side, the side of our function, we're going to evaluate from zero to b of the same function. And again, the integration here is not going to be difficult, so I have the limit as b approaches eight from the left, and then I'm going to integrate this. And so the integration says, okay, I've got if I let u equal 8 minus x, then du is going to equal negative 1 or negative dx. So in order for this to work, I'm going to need a negative on the inside. So I'm going to move a negative 3 to the outside. And then on the inside, I've got a negative 1 over 8 minus x. So now I can integrate. Again, the limit as b approaches 8 from the left of negative 3 times, and then if I integrate 8 minus x to the negative 1 half, I get 8 minus x to the positive 1 half divided by 2. I'm sorry, divided by 1 half. So 8 minus x to the positive 1 half divided by 1 half, evaluated from 0 to b doing just a little bit of cleanup work. I'm going to keep the negative 3 on the outside. All this stuff on the inside, I've got this um, divided by 1 half, so this actually is going to turn into negative 6 on the outside because that's multiplying by 2. And then I've got the square root of 8 minus x from 0 to b. So using the fundamental theorem of calculus, Again, I can't stop writing limit until I've actually evaluated the limit. I have, I'm going to keep the negative 6 on the outside just to keep things simple. I've got square root of 8 minus b minus the square root of 8 minus 0. So let's go ahead and actually use the limit this time. I've got negative 6 on the outside. 8 minus b means b as b approaches 8 from the left hand side, what's going to happen here? So again, I'm thinking about 8 minus 7, 8 minus 7.5, 8 minus 7.9, 8 minus 7.9999. What's going on as I get closer and closer to 8 from the left hand side? Well, this guy is getting closer and closer to zero because I'm getting a value that's approaching zero when I subtract. We get the idea it's getting closer to zero. So I've got negative six and then I have zero minus and then the square root of eight. So that's really my answer. 
negative 6 and then negative uh, times negative radical 8, so positive 6 radical 8. But hopefully you know that we can't leave our solution as 6 radical 8. 6 radical 8, remember if we break 8 down into radical 4 and radical 2, this radical 4 becomes a 2 on the outside, so that's 12 with radical 2 left over. So that is my solution, is 12 radical 2. So for our second example, let's take a look at what happens when we have that asymptote on the left-hand side, or if, again, it's at the lower limit of integration. So again, all I'm going to do is I'm going to be replacing the value which has the discontinuity with some other variable, the limit as that variable approaches this value, in this case from the right. Again, because this is my asymptote. So I can rewrite this as the limit as, and you can use, I used C here, but you can use A, B, C, whatever. So the limit as B approaches zero from the right of the integral from B to five of 10 over x dx. Now obviously the integration here is super duper easy because the, sorry I can't think and write at the same time, the uh, antiderivative of one over x is just the natural log of x. So I have 10 times the natural log of the absolute value of x evaluated from b to five. And the first part's very easy. Again, I'm going to continue to write the limit as b approaches zero from the right. And then a fundamental theorem of calculus says take 10 times the natural log of the absolute value of five minus 10 times the natural log of the absolute value of b. The first part of my function is not reliant on b. So that's going to give me some value. And I could evaluate what is 10 times the natural log of five. And if I wanted to, I could go ahead and put 16.09437, etc. cetera, uh, Or I could just leave it as 10 times the natural log of five. Because what I'm really focused on is what's happening here. 10 times the natural log of b. So this is not 10 times the natural log of zero because the natural log of zero is undefined because the domain for the natural log function is x is greater than zero. So we're not saying, hey, that's undefined. We're saying, okay, as I approach zero from the right-hand side of my function, so from the right, as I get closer and closer to zero, so for instance, if I took the natural log of 0.1, I would get negative 2.3 something. And if I took the natural log of 0 0.0001, I would get 0.0001, I would get negative 9.2, etc. And if I continue that pattern, I can see that as this number approaches zero, this number is going to get bigger, 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 but obviously negative. So this is going to approach negative infinity. So this is minus negative infinity. And whenever you have an infinity in here, that tells us that this diverges. For our last example, we'll take a look at what happens when you have an infinite discontinuity between the limits of integration. So quite often when students see a question like this, they say, oh, this one's pretty easy. If I integrate x to the negative third dx, I'm going to get x to the negative two divided by negative two integrated from negative one to two, which is going to give me negative one eighth plus one half, which is three eighths, done and done. And here's the problem with that is I have a giant infinite discontinuity right in the middle of that. 
I obviously have an asymptote here at x equals zero. And that's why we have this last rule, is so that we can split this up into two parts and look at each part separately to determine if it converges to a limit or if it diverges. So as I did before, again, we're going from negative one to two. So just to give us an idea of the areas that we're looking at, the first one is just going to go from negative one to zero of f of x dx. And the second one is going to go from zero to two of f of x dx. So the first one is going to be the limit as, and it can be b or a, again, whatever you need, as b approaches zero from the left-hand side of the integral from negative one to b of x to the negative three dx. And then the other one is going to be approaching from the right side, so I have plus the limit as use some different letter, c approaches zero from the right-hand side of b to two of x to the negative three dx. So for my first one, limit as b approaches zero from the left of x to the negative three is, as we talked about before, x to the negative two divided by two, or one over negative two x squared, evaluated from negative one to b. And the same thing's going to happen here, but I'm still going to have the limit as c approaches zero of, oh, this should have been c, I'm sorry about that. And then this is negative two x squared from c to two. So as I continue, this is going to be the limit as b approaches zero from the left of one over negative two b squared minus one over negative two times negative one squared. And this is the limit as c approaches zero of essentially the same thing. I'm just going to plug in two, so one over negative two times two squared minus one, oops, one over negative two times c squared. So let's start evaluating. If zero, if the limit as b approaches zero from the left-hand side means I'm getting closer and closer to zero because again, as b is approaching zero from the left, I've got negative one, negative 0.5, negative one-tenth, negative one one-hundredth, negative one one-thousandth. As I divide by, uh, let's do this up here. If I think about one over negative two times one over 1,000 squared, obviously what's going to be happening to our function, this guy, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And if I divide by a smaller number, this guy's getting bigger. So this guy approaches infinity. And the good news is I don't have to finish this question. This guy diverges. And so it doesn't matter what happens anywhere else because I have a divergent function. So this diverges. That was our last video for chapter eight. We're now going to begin chapter nine. So our first video is going to be on the limits of sequences.